Hello, I'm your host, Grayson Prolty. Welcome to another episode of SAE Tomorrow Today, a show about emerging technology and trends in mobility with the leaders and innovators who make it all happen. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to be joined by Carla Bello, the 2024 SAE President and President CEO, Ecos Consulting. On today's episode, Carla will discuss her vision for the future of the mobility industry and how SAE is leading the charge to make the lives of billions safer, more affordable, and more sustainable. We hope you enjoy this episode. Carla, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Grayson. Always happy to to join you. It's wonderful to have you here because you have really interesting, fascinating insights into the mobility markets. The, the, there's multiple markets out of mobility, and you have really great insights into them. In your opinion, what is the current state of the mobility markets? We've got positive here, negative here, confusion here. There just seems to be no pattern or no trend of where they're going. I think it's probably one of the most fascinating times that I've ever been in the industry. Because if you were to ask me this question, even four or five years ago, before COVID, I would have said, we're on the path for electrification. We're on the path for autonomy. We're going to have mobility ecosystems. We're going to have micromobility. It's going to be this you know, panacea of of ways to get around and to reduce our carbon footprint. But I think we've seen many things stop and start, and probably rightly so. Um, When we look at what's happening with electrification, the the cars are just darn expensive fundamentally, and we don't have the infrastructure that people feel comfortable, nor do we have the range on the vehicles yet, and we're being held hostage as far as raw materials are concerned, and we don't have you know, uh, uh, the ability to bring the cost down like we said we were going to be able to do. So all of these things have come together and really created a perfect storm in the world of electrification. And then, of course, automation. There's been several things that have happened in the public eye that people are distrustful. And, you know, there's so many different combinations and permutations of the artificial intelligence that have to be thought about that it's going to go slower than, you know, was originally projected for sure. Why were there plans not made? Okay, so electrification. So I'm going to remove Tesla from the equation because they're ver- vertically integrated. But the rest, you have, you have the OEM experience with, with, with GM and Nissan. Why were plans not made to secure the supply chain before committing billions of dollars to go into electrification because they're learning the harsh, cruel reality of the commodities markets right now? Yeah, and I think, you know, especially during COVID, that became very apparent. Where are we getting our, you know, necessary materials from? Where are our components coming from? Because we saw the supply chain issues really exacerbated. And I think until we saw that, I believe everyone said, hey, I've got a relationship with LG. I've got a relationship with Panasonic. I've got this relationship. They're going to manage it. It's going to be fine. But a lot of people, even back then, were taking a look and saying, wait a minute, you're getting all of your cobalt from DRC. You're getting all of your, you know, lithium through refineries in China. And, you know, 95% of the stuff is being refined in China. And we have geopolitical issues there. So I just don't, you know, despite the fact that supply chain was an element, until COVID hit, you know, the supply chain at least in the organizations I was involved in, your supply chain people just did their job and did it well and nobody paid much attention to them. And if so, and if we needed something, we just flew it in fast. But you know, you couldn't do that during COVID. So supply chain has taken a much different role in the companies than it ever had before. And I, I just, I think everyone figured, oh, it'll just happen because it always has. Yeah, and then if you look at the supply chain, for America, for the charging infrastructure in the um, the IRA bill, you had made in America. Then yesterday, the United States Senate passed. I couldn't believe they passed something, but the United States Senate passed a bill to eliminate the Made in America clause so they can build up the infrastructure. President Biden has come out forcefully saying he's going to veto it. The question is, can they override the veto? If that happens, where do we go in the politics? Is now it's you're starting to get this really interesting political divide where common sense is prevailing. You're investing this money. It just has to work. You know, every time the the politics get involved, it gets messy, right? I mean, putting, giving people incentives to buy EVs makes sense, but there's so much other pork in the IRA and in the Build Back Better that I think those unintended consequences are now coming to light. 
you know, when you have very few vehicles, if any, that can meet, you know, that, that are eligible for the incentive, we don't know how to actually provide people with the incentive well. And heck, now everybody's getting around the incentive by making leasing the standard because it didn't apply to leasing. So, you know, I think some reality is coming in that maybe we went too far too quick in requiring these huge amounts of domestic content when we don't have the capability to do it in that time frame, we're, we're basically hamstringing the industry. So a little bit of common sense we're starting to see come into play, but it, it, it's a tough challenge. And, you know, to be able to find that right balance you know, the politicians want to make manufacturing here in the U.S. And we're starting to see a lot of companies come to the U.S. as a result of the policies. But a lot of those are, you know, they're coming through partnerships with other companies like Chinese companies. And a lot of the people in those areas are starting to really put up red flags. We don't, it's fine for you to build this battery plant, but we don't want it to be owned by the Chinese. So, all of these things have to be thought about. And we, again, if we move too fast, there's going to be unintended consequences. We're always starting to see them. You're right about leasing an EV. I leased an EV and, the, and I said, hey, I want my credit. Well, finance gentleman came in. No problem. We'll give you the credit, but I had to ask for it. So you take me. So I have a th three-year lease. That's an average common lease. We're going to remove Toyota because they are traditionally, historically, four-year leases. Three-year leases, traditional. Those vehicles come off lease and say two years from now. Uh, start a year from now. So come on, please. What happens? Because all the day, scientific data that I've read and all, all the Wall Street analyst reports I've read, we have not figured out battery recycling. Yes, J.B. Straubel and Redwood is trying, but we have not seen it proof in the pudding. So what happens to all these vehicles when they come off a lease? Do they just sit there and rot? I mean, what what happens? We didn't really think about that very well, did we? I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that anytime we build a battery plant, a recycling plant should be next door, right? Because that will, of course, help us with our critical materials issue, too, if we can get those materials back out and reuse them. But we don't we don't know how to do that. And there's three different processes, as you know well, for, for battery recycling, and none of them are easy and none of them are great in terms of energy efficiency so far. But I think we have to be doing that. Now, what's going to happen with these vehicles? It, I think it depends. First of all, if the, if the battery health is still okay, and if we had a good way to measure the state of health of a battery, then I think a lot of people can get these cheap and give them to, you know, uh, I think especially young people, it's economical. They can't go that far. I mean, what a great thing. Okay, I'm giving you this car, but you can't go over 70 miles or you gotta, you're going to run out of charge, right? So your kid isn't going to drive that far, you hope. Um, I think there can be secondary lives. I, but, you know, a lot of people have talked about, let's pull the batteries out and use them for storage of power as backup grids. But the effectiveness of that, and as battery technology keeps getting better and better, you're going to have these old batteries that are going to be obsolete within, you know, six months or even less. So it's another case where we didn't think about the entire ecosystem before, you know, we just ran with technology. And I think that's really an interesting point, especially for SAE to think about, is technology is eating the world right now and leading. So we're leading with technology and our engineers are very smart and we're leading with that, but we're not thinking about the social aspects, the sustainability aspects and the entire picture of how it affects people in general. I agree with that. I read a fascinating article this weekend in the Wall Street Journal about EV battery fires and they interviewed several fire chiefs. Mm -hmm. And now the, the most successful way to how to put out a fire, this blew my mind, let it burn. Mm -hmm. because they, the, the water, they don't have the foam, and uh, 3M is working on different technology to, to try and do it. And then a uh, fire chief from Fort Myers, Florida, which ha unfortunately had the hurricane two years ago, said the amount of EVs are catching fire because all the salt water got into the battery. Mm -hmm. And the fire chief's concern is he does not know when and where they're going to explode because of all, all the EVs in Fort Myers. Mm -hmm. So this goes into the – how do we prepare for this, or how do we develop this ecosystem of all the – the what ifs, all the risk factors, and then put together mitigation strategies. 3M is great scientists. They invented the post-it. They invented all sorts of coatings for automobiles. They're going to fix this. 
But how do we get this ecosystem to come together and look at all the problems? And you've alluded to it several times, but I want to highlight yeah. the fact that America hasn't built a refinery since the 70s. What? That's another thing that has to be discussed. Yep. It just seems yep. like we're rushing in. Yeah, we really are. And we don't have the policies or the standards in place to be able to manage it properly. I think even, you know, I just read today the um, the standards to be able to to be able to work on a battery electric vehicle. Now we're actually going to have some by 2024. Six, I think it said, but the industry really has to come together and work together. And this is something the industry does not play nicely. We we don't necessarily, we think it's our secret sauce. If you want to put out a GM battery fire here, we've got this, we've got this procedure for you. But if you, if you were to ask Ford or if you were to ask Toyota or someone, can you use this? Oh no, we're going to make our own. But, you know, when it comes to the safety of the population, doesn't it make sense to have one standard way to put out a battery fire? And by the way, can we all agree on the solvent to be able to put out that fire? And can we all agree on this is how we have to go about training? So to be able to convene all these companies that are natural competitors to agree on how to do this, the standard to do it, Again, that's something I think SAE is primed to do. And it's not just going to be in the automotive world. We've got VTOLs, we've got drones, we've got airplanes that now are electric vehicles as well. And, and the, the problem is going to become much more profound, you know, as we move further into electrification of everything. Do you see SAE being the, what's called the great convener of bringing this together to solve the hard problems? It's just basically sit there with a whiteboard and get some, and and say, okay, here's all the problems that we need to come together on. You got to solve battery fires. You got to solve re replacements. You have to solve the hurricane issue. And I'm sure at some point there's going to be a tar issue from a, from a road. There's going to be all sorts of issues every day that we're going to impact the battery. And get committees together to come together and say we need to solve this. Be otherwise, the government's going to come in and start mandating things. And what the consumer's going to do. We're not paying this. We're going back to internal combustion engine, and then we're back to, to phase one again. You have to have the entire ecosystem managed so that the customer feels comfortable to spend the money. And it, they're not going to spend the money also until they get cheaper. I mean, the majority of Americans can't afford an EV. They can't afford an ICE today. Um, you know, when you look at the price and where the where the loan rates are and, you know, you look at monthly costs, I mean, you're looking today between eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month. Many people can't afford that period. So that's another big problem. But I think in terms of having the cross sectional view of of the industry, that's where SAE can go to these companies and say, look, we need to formulate a committee on this, 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 and this. And by the way, this is our view. What do you think we need to convene committees on? And, you know, if we put it under, you know, strict confidentiality and decide up front, what are the things we can talk about? What are the things we cannot talk about? Because I think that has to be clarified or the industry is going to say, uh -uh, I'm not participating. Then I think we can begin to work on some of these things. But even when I think about, you know, what happened during COVID where cities completely changed their road structure to keep people safe when we had to put restaurants out in the streets. Some of these things were quite clever and need to, to live on if we think about the mobility future of tomorrow. And, you know, does that mean SAE needs to be involved in urban planning more, you know, to really begin to look at, you know, how we design cities, how we design our roadways, how we keep people safe in a world of V to X where everything is communicating and what kind of rules can we think about and how can we urge some of the existing building codes to just go by the wayside um, and get people thinking we don't need two charging stations for a hotel that fits 400, you know, you need at least 20, let's say, and that's probably not even enough. But, you know, how to get people thinking differently and how to put that into some of our codes that actually make a difference. How to plumb in an EV in your house, same as you plumb in a dryer. 
You know, you should have an EV charger plumbed in. You don't have to put in the charger, but just have it plumbed. You know, that's that's easy to do. It's easy to do, but there's cost. You have to. I, I had a, You have to pull a permit to put in an EV charger, and they have to pay a gentleman a thousand dollars to install it. So a permit's five hundred, installs a thousand, charger's five hundred. So now you're at, you're at two thousand dollars of, of of additional cost. Let's just so you're about seventy five dollars a month, and then nobody talks about the insurance rate. It's a lot more expensive because the parts in, in the in the battery. Why is all that not factored in? It's not discussed. It's kind of push to the side and the consumer has I'll call it insurance shock. Oh, I got this great rebate. Oh my god, I got I'm still paying it cuz I got to pay for it in insurance. And as we know in a, in, a, in a bad economy history and we have data to back us up, the first thing to go is the insurance. Then we've got a huge issue with uninsured motorist issue that that's only going to expand. And- yeah, I think we're already seeing that it's there. I mean, people get their insurance, but then they cancel it. And especially in the used vehicle market, I think we have to be talking about the total cost of ownership and insurance hasn't been talked about um, in terms, you know, in the terms that you're talking about. I think also we have been talking about insurance. You've seen it out of Consumer Reports. You've seen it out of AAA about the higher cost for these vehicles that have the safety systems. In general, you think you should get a lower, lower insurance cost because these vehicles have all these systems intended to make your driving better so you don't get in collisions. But actually, the replacement parts are so much more expensive because you have all that technology embedded that they're actually more expensive. So we, we've gone exactly opposite. And I think until we can confirm that that vehicle will never crash, which I don't know is ever possible, that I, I'm not sure we'll see insurance rates go down, which brings us to why don't we think about vehicles in terms of usership and not ownership? Because ownership is what really, you know, that that brings that eight hundred to a thousand dollar a month cost. What if I could just use other forms of transit predominantly, and then when I need a vehicle? be able to use something, you know, if depending on, you know, where I'm going, the length of time, you know, I've talked about this for a long time that, you know, dealerships, maybe instead of thinking about leasing a vehicle per se, you lease a vehicle, you, you lease a package and you get X number of days of a, of a EV, you get X number of a big SUV because you go to the mountains, you know, how to think about customizing a vehicle usership package that that makes sense both financially and environmentally. Porsche's tried it. I was I was had part of that program. I remember Cadillac, <laughs> Cadillac tried it. So there's been moving. No, nobody's really cracked it. But on the insurance thing, so let's look at Tesla. Tesla has they help. They have a captive insurance program. Let's take uh, Mercedes Benz for example. On all their EVs have telematics in them. All that data is going to MB, MBFS, for our listeners who are unsure what that is. That's Mercedes-Benz Financial Services that underwrites the leases. All that data in real time in your MBFS account is going there. They know your driving pattern. They know your speed. They have no problem selling you a upgrade to go faster for $1,100. Why not? They're getting the data. Why not do a captive through a reinsurer? And, and then maybe that could help lower the prices. Or you bundle. So this is where I get interested where you're going with this. Bundle them the price of the lease. The lease is X amount of dollars, insurance included. Oh, okay. Maybe that gets them over the hump because I think it's all these ancillaries that go into it is what scares the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned that many companies have already tried it. Yes, they have, but it was unaffordable for most people. I mean, the programs themselves were just out of reach and it has to be okay for the everyday person. And that may mean I just need a vehicle for an hour. I don't need it a whole day, you know, just to take, I have to take, you know, my elderly, you know, father or mother to the doctor. I need it for an hour. And, you know, there's no public transit I can use and I, they can't manage in public transit. And by the way, I need to have a car that, that manages a wheelchair. You know, you, you've got all these individual circumstances. And I think what becomes really problematic is when you think about that as a business person, you think, oh my God, I'm going to have to have a lot the size of, you know, Disney World's lot to be able to have all these potential vehicles. 
But if you think about how smart you can be with artificial intelligence, with, you know, being able to move vehicles about and or configure them quickly, I think we have to think about a whole different way of how we manufacture vehicles in terms of configurability. You, you have to have new ideas because if you look at the way we currently do things, it does become untenable very quickly. When I've talked about vehicle usership versus vehicle ownership, what I always talk about is we need to design the car completely differently. It needs to be designed differently and manufactured differently. You know, to, to be able to change the carpet in a vehicle, you have to remove the center console. Well, if that's the case, you're going to completely destroy the integrity of that product because you can't do that and put it back together without creating squeaks and rattles and other problems. It's impossible. So, you know, how to design it so that you can easily remove the carpet or so you can easily remove a seat and maybe put in a, a wheelchair. You know, all of these things to think about configurability, you know, transformers kind of logic you know, it, it requires huge changes. It's going to require huge changes in the standards, in the cookbooks that engineers use today in automotive companies. And, you know, without thinking differently and being willing, you know, to have new ideas at the table, which, by the way, is what young people want to do. And they might be more willing to work in the automotive industry if they could do this more fun stuff. We have to have this kind of ingenuity to solve the problems. We do. If you look at the, the Rivians, they have a huge insurance problem because that back bumper goes all the way up to the size one piece. And, yep. and $7,000 to replace it. $7,000 because it was manufactured as, as one part. So that ties right into yours. It, it, it's unaffordable. It's not scalable. So I'm going to put my airline hat on here for a moment. So I'm Boeing or, or, or I'm Airbus or I'm Embraer. Is it time for global OEMs to start thinking about fuselages? Because if you're going on an Air France flight versus a Delta flight versus an American, the interior is different. Or if it's a private for a round the world trip, it's different. And then you can rip out the seats and customize it. Is it time for OEMs to start thinking that they're in the fuselage business, not necessarily the vehicle business? Well, you're taking a page out of many presentations that I've given. And I often say, yes, it's time for the, the automotive industry to start thinking about the airline because the body of a plane lasts years and years and years, but the interior is consistently updated and changed and revised. The electronics are changed. Everything is changed to keep up with the needs of the customer. So, you know, in the few, in a world of vehicle ownership, are you going to really care what the exterior styling looks like? Probably not. I know when, when I use a ride share, I don't, when I see a, a Jeep Cherokee or, you know, let's say a forerunner, I don't care. I mean, it wouldn't be cars I would buy, but I don't care. I'm just sitting in it and riding. So, you know, in the future when I don't own it and I'm just using it, I don't care what it looks like. And this kills me to say it because I'm an automotive veteran. I love vehicle styling. I think cars have personalities based on how they're styled, but it kills me to say it. But in this new world of mobility, I don't think people will care. So being able to keep that external part and then be able to configure the interior, to be able to personalize it for what you know about this person using AI technology. Hey, Carla likes red and purple. Well, let's give her some red and purple interior components. You know, and that should be easy to do with inserts and swapping, boom. She wants it for an hour, we've configured it. And by the way, the next person who wants it the next hour, they like green, we're gonna change it again. But it can be done pretty darn fast and probably using robotic technology versus using human beings. but really thinking about how we can how we can manage this shared economy but still allow mobility that we don't allow today it's not hard to change the lighting the app already knows okay so you want a red lighting i want a green lighting in the interior okay that's easy and then the, to me the, the the next big thing to come for the interior is augmented reality when the when the glass comes to life and you start having all these experiences because you're right if you look at Disney and various other people, you care about the, the internal experience because the windows could be blacked out, they could be movie theaters. But yet there's outside of Apple, Apple has several patent filings on this for, for augmented reality for glass. Corning has done some research on it. 
they're really the OEMs are just more focused on design, like you said, and not really what is that passenger experience. Mercedes is an outlier with their hyper screen they co-developed with NVIDIA. That's impressive where they're trying to go, but nobody's publicly went for the glass yet. When do we get there when the glass starts becoming the new screen? Boy, you know, you have to weigh that with distractions, right? Um, and until until we can until we can get i guess the human out of the equation more it's going to be a tough sell because people are easily distracted i mean look today i mean i even see semi truck drivers looking at their phones and it makes me cringe because they have a you know a torpedo that they're driving down the roadways the technology is there but how to do it in a safe manner i think is what we have to try to figure out and as you know well we put all these safety systems in the vehicle but we didn't standardize what they do so people don't understand what they're doing they're beeping at them they don't know why they're you know jerking them back into the lane. They don't know why. And so they're turning the darn things off. You know, over 50% of the people are turning off the things that we put in the cars to keep them safe. So, you know, we have to, again, it's technology not making a lot of sense. And we throw these cars at people and don't teach them what these systems are doing and how they can help them. You know, then people have a distrust of the technology and it takes us back in the, in the curve. You know, we start going back into the, the abyss of, of, you know, distrust versus acceptance. You got to remember people in the equation. And, and I think as engineers, sometimes we forget about people. It's, it's, the, it's the technology. It's the cool stuff. We get it. We're engineers. It's awesome. It's technology. But we forget that people need to use it and understand it and make it simple so that, you know, again, people can realize it's helping, not, you know, not meant to be bothersome. So how to put that human element in it even more? We all have ergonomics engineers, but ergonomics just thinks about the motions. They don't think about the brain. So how to get more anthropologists and others into the business that really think about how humans think, I think will help us tremendously. Yes, we need a lot of engineers, but I think when you get that diversity on the team is where you really make inroads. Is what you're describing, is that opening the door for the growth of in-cabin monitoring, since you can really de de detect what the human's doing in the vehicle? Isn't that, a, you know, I I'm, I have very independent children, and I can tell you what they'd tell me about in-cabin monitoring. <laughs> no um, way, Jose. <laughs> yeah, they'd be like, uh-uh, uh-uh, nobody's going to be doing that. And in fact, my car tells me, it thinks it tells me when I need a break. It's like, driver attention, need a break. And it's usually when I'm talking to my husband about sports and we're really getting excited about something. And I'm on a, I'm on a road that, you know, I live in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, yes, I probably wasn't looking straight ahead that long, but no, I don't need a break. I'm wide awake. You know, I'm just discussing <laughs> something vehemently. Um, so the car thought I wasn't paying attention or I wasn't paying enough attention, but it actually wasn't right. So, if we're going to think about in-cabin monitoring, there has to be a win on the other side. So what's the win for the person? Is it, you know, just looking at me to make sure my hands are on the wheel if I'm in cruise mode or, you know, if that's the case, that's not helpful. So what becomes helpful for me on the other side? Yes, we want to keep people not distracted, but at the same time, playing police or or watching me secretly probably isn't going to change my behavior it's just going to make me angry so again it's i think it's that people element and and you know finding that win win on both sides you have to have the win win on both sides you're taking a very holistic approach to mobility you're not looking at this through one lens you're looking at this from a holistic approach from a giant ecosystem are you going to bring that to your 2024 SAE presidency of looking at this bigger picture and the problems that we can come together to solve? You know, I was on the board once before as the VP automotive. And at that time, I, I was singing in the same tune that we have to be 
We have to be looking at this very holistically. I think we need to take a look at our composition of our existing committees. Do we have the right diversity in those committees? We need to look at the diversity of the board. It's not where I want it to be. You know, when we think about, you know, future people to bring on the board, maybe it doesn't have to be somebody who's worked in R&D their career and is a geeky engineer. Maybe we want somebody who maybe was an engineer by degree, but they worked in finance or they worked in HR or they worked someplace else because they have a different view about what we're doing. And, you know, maybe we don't just want automotive industry and in convict people, maybe we should be bringing in a lot more people from the startups or from the mining industry or supply chain. I really want to focus on this diversity because I think for engineering, we need to have students that are excited about what engineering can offer because engineers can change the world. We can make the world better. Thinking about how we teach differently in universities, as you know, I'm on other university boards and College of Engineering boards, how we can talk differently about technology to make students think more holistically. And then, you know, how we can bring that into SAE by this diverse diversity of thought, looking beyond just we design, we build, we sell vehicles how we can think about recycling at the end, how those standards can help really change the environment and make it better. And so we don't create problems as we have in the past via technology. I love the vision. How do you get these individuals from from mining, from startups, from supply chain to the table to engage in that conversation? Well, the good news is I think many of us in the industry now are starting to talk to these people much more than ever before as we look to form partnerships, et cetera. So I think we have to rely on our members to be able to tell us, hey, this person is a fabulous engineer from this you know, kind of company, or heck, we can go out and talk to these companies and you know, explain who we are, explain full sight, you know, explain you know, what our purpose is, why we need them at the table and maybe encourage, you know, them to at least, you know, become members or offer the membership to their to their engineering teams or to their teams. Show them the benefit of being part of our ecosystem. It's part of one of your your big roles as the 2024 president is doing outreach, having community conversations, talking to diverse stakeholders and starting to lay that groundwork to bring them into the organization. Well, I know for sure one of the things that I'll be out doing is going to a number of our events. And in those events, I'll be making darn sure that I'm interacting with a number of the people there. I'm not going to be there just to give a speech and leave because anybody can give a speech. But uh, I'll be there actually listening to what people's concerns are how they how the organization should be made better how we can make it better and bringing those things back to the board because i think you know the board's role is to think strategically about the health of the organization and make sure that we're providing for the members what they need that makes their job better or helps them in their in their day-to-day work so being able to bring that information back to the board, discussing it with the SAE team. This this is what I'll be doing when I go to visit, you know, the different regions. I'll be doing the same thing because I think there's a big difference in what's happening in India and what's happening in Japan and what's happening in Europe versus what's happening here. So if you don't have that kind of global input, I think you're going to miss a whole heck of a lot. And then to make sure that SAE is able to provide the services that we need to for this um, demographic is really, really important. Thank you for highlighting the global perspective. There's a, there's a, there's a lot going on in the world Uh, over the weekend. I was in the financial times reading a whole piece about uh, the Maldives and how the Maldives is becoming a critical military base for India, which China's kicking them out now and, and, and a shipping maritime for China. It's becoming a geopolitical hotspot. You think of the Maldives, you think of resorts, but it's playing a critical role in, in maritime do you see SAE eventually at some point going into maritime? Because you have two themes. You have the decarbonization of maritime going on, and you have the the, uh, the automation going in maritime with the big ships. And I was speaking to some recreational boaters. They said the most dangerous time in a boat 
is the docking and undocking. So perhaps that could be automated. Do you eventually see perhaps SAE getting into maritime at some point? I think the world of mobility includes all of that. You know, we're starting to see even electrification of pleasure boats, right? And engineers are doing that work too. So people are going to get around how it's best for them to get around. And, you know, we've had ferries for a number of years. We've had, you know, shipping in the big, in the big cargo ships. We saw how that, how that is at risk now. We see the Panama Canal getting, getting shallower. We see the Suez getting shallower. The whole supply chain and the way we move things about is going to change. When we look at, you know, it, even when we look at getting it from the ports to the various places from a hub and spoke perspective, that's going to change. So if we're if we think about how to move people and goods and services, I don't know how you can discount any form of mobility fundamentally. And, you know, SAE, even though we have automotive in our name, we are about mobility and providing mobility. And mobility of tomorrow is going to include air. It's going to include sea. It's going to include rivers. It's going to include canals. People have been moving in those ways for a long, long time. And when you talk about sustainability and decarbonization, that's happening in maritime big time with nuclear as well as other um, sustainable fuels. I, I think we have to think about how this convergence of technology in many industries can actually serve to strengthen and enhance. We shouldn't be segmented, convex aerospace, automotive, because fundamentally the systems are becoming almost the same when you think about it. So how can we become less complex and really focus on those core issues? Maybe it needs to be by electrification, sustainability. You know, it, maybe we need to think completely differently about, you know, how we're currently managing, which is a t it's going to be a tightrope because You've got people who are used to these committees and used to this is the way we do things in SAE. And if we try to shake it up, we try to shake it up too quickly, there's going to be unintended consequences. So you have to think about how best to merge or to, to morph ourselves into the industry that we want to be tomorrow. It's almost like you need a, a melting pot committee or a melting pot event where things just come together organically and they, they discuss because you can learn from maritime, you can learn from off-road. In your opinion, what does the future of SAE look like? So first of all, I'd like to see a lot more diversity. I'd like to see a lot more diversity of gender, a lot more diversity of background, a lot more diversity of ethnicity. I think this is really needed to be able to create the right standards and provide the right, I'll just say, advice and thoughts for the future of, of the industries. Then I think, you know, I think... The world still needs the standards that we produce. They are vital. But I think we need to become much more agile in how we how we produce them and how we revise them. Because technology, again, is moving so quickly that if we don't become more agile and, and fast with the things that we do, we simply will become non-relevant. And other bodies will do it and or new organizations will be started that will do it. So I think we really have to think about rapidity and how we can organize ourselves to think differently and to move differently. And again, you're going to have to do it in a way that gets the membership in, you know, engaged and in line. And it might might be, you know, some of the people who have been, you know, staunch supporters for a number of years may decide this isn't the SAE for me anymore. As long as you've got new thinkers to come in and and, you know, manage that. And I don't want that to sound cold hearted at all, because I know we have a lot of legacy um, and, and we have to move this properly again, so that we don't have those unintended consequences of moving too fast. But I think if we don't stay more agile and more relevant, we run the risk of becoming the dinosaurs of the standards world and others are just going to eat our lunch. All businesses, I'm not saying move fast, break things, staying ahead of the curve is, is a tool in the toolbox, and you can implement it in a variety of ways. So staying ahead of the curve is one of the key things that SAE is going to have to achieve in the future is what you're clearly describing. Carla, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? I would really like them to 
you know, think about what the future, how, how SAE can really change the thinking of engineers, can help companies realize their strategies of tomorrow that indeed make the world safer and cleaner, more healthy, more renewable. How we can think about designing our systems differently so that, again, we are inherently creating solutions with a very holistic thought. And I always go back to um, one thing I learned about Seventh Generation and why they named their company they, the name they gave it was because the Indian chiefs back in the day, they never made a decision without thinking about what it would mean for seven generations beyond. And seven generations were much shorter then because people didn't live that long. But nonetheless, thinking out and having engineers think differently from the very beginning, if I do this today, what's it going to mean for my great grandchildren or, you know, in 50 and 100 years? And also thinking about when I design it, it's not permanent for 30 or 50 years. We often think that way about the things that we design, but you know, it might only be good for two or three years. And I need to be thinking about that next solution right now. So, you know, these are the things that, that I often talk about when we're, you know, discussing various elements, really how to bring in all of the, the things that, that we talk and we do and in our committees to really be thinking about you know, how the future is going to be impacted by what we're doing and how we're managing our business. Well said. Standards make the world go round. Don't forget about the generations coming after you. Today is tomorrow. Tomorrow's today. The future is SAE. Carl, thank you so much for coming on SAE tomorrow today. Thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to SAE tomorrow today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. Be sure to join us next week as we speak with Jill K. Sanchez, Director of Sustainability, Deer & Company, about how Deer is embracing tech innovation for a more sustainable future. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.